Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. Our intestine is inhabited by a vast number of microorganisms, about 10 to the 14th power. In recent years, it has become increasingly clear that these microorganisms play a crucial role for our health. They determine which diseases we might get, how prone we are to becoming diabetic, for example, or to developing autoimmune diseases or certain types of cancer. These microorganisms even seem to influence our behavior. From October 8th to 10th, 2014, the Volkswagen Foundation held a Herrenhausen conference exploring the burning questions and unsolved problems of microbiota research. The opening keynote was given by the Danish molecular biologist Karsten Christiansen. Christiansen is the head of the Department of Biology at the University of Copenhagen. He is also a professor at the BGI Shenzhen in China. This is not merely an interesting biographical detail, but directly relevant to Christiansen's research. Comparing the structure of microbiomes in China and Denmark plays a pivotal role in his work. The differences show how much influence the way we live has on our gut. For example, our diet. The Chinese microbiomes have many more enzymes to degrade simple sugars, which you need for digesting rice. In China, antibiotics are also widely used and available over the counter, whereas in Denmark, the use is much more restricted. This too is reflected in the microbiomes. Chinese people have many more enzymes for degrading antibiotics than Danish people do. Even exposure to pollution can be detected in the gut. Carsten Christiansen's talk is titled The Gut Microbiota in Health and Disease. He gave this talk on October 8, 2014 at the Herrenhausen Conference Beyond the Intestinal Microbiome from Signatures to Therapy. The conference was organized by the Volkswagen Foundation and took place in Hanover, Germany. First of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure being here. And I'll try to walk you through some of the work we're doing in Copenhagen and in China. And honestly, I must admit, I've seen a list of the speakers here, and there are really a lot of excellent researchers. And sometimes I still feel like a Dane, you know, like an ugly duckling, because we started this work about five years ago. So I still feel myself a little bit like a newcomer. But also working in China, it, I think it creates some advantages. So let's, let's start. First of all, you may wonder where I'm actually doing my work. So this is Copenhagen up here. Down here we have Hanover. And over here next to Hong Kong, we have BGI Shenzhen and Shenzhen. Shenzhen is an interesting city. It was founded some 35 years ago by Deng Xiaoping. At that time, he decided that there should be sort of a counterpart to Hong Kong. And then he decided to put a city there and to make this what they call the special economic zone. Today, 35 years after, there's at least 12 million people living here. The average age in Shenzhen is probably below 30. So it's a very dynamic and interesting area. So I spent quite a lot of time there because it's I mean, China is China, so it has advantages, it has disadvantages. One advantage is that if you make a decision, it, it works very rapidly. If you make a wrong decision, it also works very rapidly. So this is sort of the trade-off. OK, uh, I thought, given the audience, I don't have to introduce a lot about the microbiome. Just a few things. This is how at least half of you depict yourself. And as you probably know, this is what you really are, 19 percent bacterial cells and 10 percent human cells. And if you work on, it even becomes worse because there are at least 300 times more bacterial genes inside and outside your body than you have genes yourself in your own cells. And these different bacteria they harbor virtually all places. You have them inside, you have them on the skin, you have them in all orifices, you have them in particular in the gut. You have some in the lung as well. But we are particularly interested in what happens in the gut because this has profound in, uh, effect on life. So there are good things and there are bad things about the gut bacteria. The good things are that they make a lot of uh, complex uh, works for us. They digest complex molecules that we otherwise cannot digest. 
They um, <coughs> crowd out pathogens, so you're less susceptible for diseases. The great toxin produce vitamins. It's quite important. Produce essential amino acids, produce hormones, and last but not least, they train the immune system. Unless you have a properly functioning gut microbiota, you don't have a functional a good functional uh, immune system. But there are, of course, uh, backside of this as well. We know now that uh, dysfunction or dysbiosis of the gut microbiome is associated with inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, obesity, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, asthma, psoriasis, allergies, and even some behavior traits, which is going to be a quite interesting area to dig into. So this pro and cons. So what are the problems? One problem is that about only 10% of all the bacteria in our gut can be cultivated easily, leaving about 90% below surface. And in order to get that, we need to do sort of another way of characterizing using large-scale deep sequencing. And this is one reason that I stay a lot in China, because at BDI in Shenzhen, we have quite a nice setup for sequencing. So in Shenzhen and Hong Kong, we have a facility in Hong Kong as well, we have about 150 high sec machines running constantly. We have a number of solids, we have complete genomics prototypes, which is probably going to be the next generation sequencing technology. And then in Denmark, we also have 10 high secs next door to our department. On top of that, at BDI, we have about 1,500 bioinformaticians sitting and digesting the data. And even, though, and even though BDI probably has some of the largest supercomputers on Earth, it's still the bottleneck. The bioinformatics analysis is the bottleneck, and doing deep sequencing doesn't make it easier. You need a very, very large and skilled crew to deal with all this data. And even with this number, we still have problems to analyze all the data that is generated. So then you could wonder, why, why would you like to um, to do this deep sequencing, why don't you rely on 16S sequencing, which provide, which provide a lot of information and actually is quite useful? I think there's a number of reasons. If you really want to know what the functional competences are in a, in a genome, you need to do deep sequencing. You need to know what genes are there. Uh, it's also very important to have these information on genes if you want to do uh, meta transcriptomics or meta uh, proteomics, because you need something to refer to and to align to. And based on that sequencing, deep sequencing, where we have the genes, we can now do bioinformatics tricks where we simply bin genes or contexts which have the same abundance, relative abundance, into what we call either metagenomic species or metagenomic linkage groups. That the two terms are used sort of interchangeable. And I think this is very important. Eventually, it might be possible to do much cheaper sequencing and deep sequencing using the new complete genomics platform. We are actually doing some, running some tests now. We have some problems. Bioinformatics is a problem with the very short reach we get for complete genomics. But we think we will solve them in a couple of months. And if so, we can do it much, much cheaper. Meaning that instead of running thousands of samples, we can actually deal with millions of samples. So this is why I think it's important to have catalogs and good catalogs of human, other model organisms, and you name it. So what I'll do today is I will start out to sort of make a status on where are we in terms of generating very comprehensive catalogs. And I'll start out with the human catalogs. As some of you know, we, uh, together with the MetaHeat Consortium, produced this first catalog of the gut microbiome in humans, and it was published some four years ago. Now we have just published sort of a revised version, an updated version where we now have a 10 million human gut microbiome catalog. So we now have a catalog of almost 10 million different genes that harbor the human gut. And what we did was that we actually took these three cohorts, the European cohort, the Metaheat cohort, the Chinese cohort, we had an American cohort, and then we took all the data. We sort of supplemented, we, ad, we analyzed another couple of hundred uh, samples from the Metaheat consortium, and then we combined all that into what we call the three, con, uh, three cohort uh, gene catalog. Then we also took all the annotated genes that had been sequenced, and we sort of selected those genes that were abundant in the gut. And all together, we were able to combine and make this catalog of, of roughly 10 million genes. So what is sort of, why could we find more genes, and what are these genes? 
And say, in 2010, we had 3.3 million genes based on 124 samples. Now we have analyzed a little less, 1,300 samples, now we have the 10 million genes. What we can see is that those genes that are very abundant, um, they actually don't move much. But what we see here is that genes that have very low abundance, of very low prevalence, they are actually the ones that now contribute to this uh, 10 million catalog genes. So these are the rare genes, those that are not present in very large quantities. So this is one important thing. Now we can ask how good is this catalog? And comparing, for instance, the old meter heat catalog to see if we, if we make a read in the meter genome and then see how much can we map on the catalog. Up, originally we could map a little less than 70%, now we can map more than 80%. And considering that the open reading frames in a bacteria probably constitute something like 87%, we are probably very close to having saturated. And if we make this analysis using CAO2, we see that the gene catalog we have now comprising these 10 million genes probably correspond to a coverage of around 95.5%. So it's a pretty complete catalog. So what do we gain having this deep sequencing and this improved sensitivity? It's very clear that we can see that uh, species, a lot of species here that we know a lot of, for instance, uh, the genera like Bacteroides, I mean, we don't gain a lot. We get a sort of 10, 20% improvement in these sort of abundant bacterial genera. But those that are more uh, uh, rarely found in the gut microbiome, these are the ones that really now pops up. And as you can see here, we sort of increase uh, improved coverage by some 80 to 90%, meaning that in the old catalog, these rare genera would not be detected. But now we can detect them. And also, if you look in, in, in the species level, you can see here how we actually improve the uh, catalog. The blue here is a meter hit sample based on the 121. Now that we include another 1,000 samples, we get much better coverage of these different, these are just examples of different species that now are more or less completely covered by the new catalog. And if you go into, say, an E. coli strain, again, you can see that having this improved catalog, we are able now to map almost 100 so you can see now we have about at least a little more than 80% coverage, meaning again, we probably cover most of the open reading frames. So another thing you could ask, these uh, rare species, these rare genes, what, what do they represent? And analyzing that, I mean, we can take the bottom line here. It's in, we have the common gene, and, and these common genes, these are common to most individuals, and they sort of deal with uh, uh, traits of the different functions that are common to all, meaning like carbohydrate, amino acid transport, and metabolism. And then we find these, uh, in the, what we call individual specific. These are the genes that we find in less than 1% abundancy. And this is very clear that they are enriched in cell membrane, envelope, biogenesis, DNA, replication, recombination, repair. So we would say that the common gene, they supply functions that are essential for the bacterial survival. And individual genes reflect adaptation to the host immune system, to viral infection, antibiotic treatments, and other challenges that are experienced by the gut microbiome. So we can sort of divide these rare genes that we're now detecting. These are the ones that are maybe most interesting in terms of, of uh, uh, interaction with the immune system. So having these uh, different things, of course, working in Denmark and China, we said, what are the differences? And, and there are differences. This is a Danish speech. This is a Chinese speech. This is very close to where I live in Shenzhen. And this is not exaggerated. This is what it looks like in August, September, and not even during daytime or during night. So um, there are differences, of course, different food, different uh, environment, and so on. But it's very interesting that we can actually cluster in what is Chinese specific and what is Danish enriched, I should say. And one thing which was quite interesting is if we just take the two populations and compare two cohorts, we can rather clearly separate Chinese from Danes, whether or not they are obese or, or lean. Another thing we noticed is that the um, diversity, the alpha diversity, seems to be lower in Chinese than in Danes. And we actually have some indications that also gene count seems to be lower in the Chinese population. And that may have some very interesting implications since we, in terms of obesity and inflammation, think that low gene count is related to inflammatory states. We are investigating that. We don't have the answer. But it seems pretty robust that we have this sort of less diverse um, microbiome in the Chinese compared to the Danes. 
and also go into <clears throat> more detailed analysis, we can actually see how different types of bacteria, either phyla or genera, are more enriched in the Chinese than in the Danish population. Uh, for instance, something like um, <clears throat> proteobacteria seems to be much more abundant in Chinese. This, of course, could reflect genetics, it could reflect uh, diets, it could reflect environments. And when it comes to diet, <clears throat> it's very clear that we see some signatures that are, sort of make a lot of sense to us, because if you look into the uh, Danish microbiota, it seems as if enzymes that are involved in degradation of complex hard to digest carbohydrates, they are enriched in the Danish population. Whereas in the Chinese population, we see an enrichment in, uh, in uh, enzymes that degrade the simple sugars, monosaccharides, disaccharides, which you get from rice. So it makes a lot of sense. And then this is a little bit funny because it seems as if uh, the Danish microbiome are much more, uh, produce a much, lot more of hydrogen and, and methane than um, than the Chinese, and then you can sort of speculate, say, what does it mean? I mean, the Chinese, they leave, I mean, they, they, they expire or they bulb or they burp, uh, whereas the Dane, they maybe um, get rid of the air from the other end. So that would be the interpretation of this finding. Um, another site which is maybe not so good, you could say it might be advantageous, is that if you look in the Chinese population, we see that the microbiome really have an overrepresentation of uh, KOs that relate to antibiotic resistance. And this simply reflects that in China, you buy a lot of antibiotics over the counter. You fill yourself with a lot of different stuff. And this is reflected in the microbiome. This is a very nice uh, center of what, what you have been ingesting. And it's very clear that in China, you see a lot of these uh, antibiotic degrading enzymes, whereas in Denmark, where antibiotic use is much more restricted, you only see uh, resistant, uh, gene coding resistant to penicillin, uh, penicillin degradation. So it's very clear. This is not very nice. And it's sort of probably, unfortunately, reflect that in China also people are exposed to a lot of environmental pollutants. And we sort of see that in the, uh, in the microbiome because you can say it's nice to have the enzymes that can degrade all these pollutants they are exposed to, but it also really signifies they are exposed to a lot. And that goes for aromatic carcinogens, and it also goes for nitric oxides. It's a big problem in, in China now because of the exhaust from cars and, and industry that they have very high level of nitrogen oxides. And we see that very clearly. All the rate is overrepresented in the Chinese population. So that is a very sort of, we think it's a neat and interesting way to measure exposure in a large population. So if we sum that all up, it's very clear that in Denmark we have, uh, yeah, this is quite funny, uh, you know, cocos, this is a, a, a bug that is involved in wine production. So, of course, we find that in the Danes. Um, but then we also have, we, of course, have a lot of milk, ingestion of milk and milk products. So we have a lot of lactobacillus and, and bifidobacteria. We also, fortunately, have a lot of bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids. We have this hydrogen and methane production, which might be not so easy, so nice. So this is the Danish side. The Chinese side, I didn't have time to go into that. It's very clear that the Chinese metagenome is very enriched in, in, um, in enzymes producing vitamin B, and also a lot of essential amino acids. We have been discussed what that means. The Chinese thing, it means that the Chinese depend on the production of, of essential fat, uh, uh, amino acids from the gut. My interpretation is more that the Chinese food is deficient in these essential amino acids, and that's why the box have to sort of develop that ability. We're still debating that. But also you can see over here you have a lot of these uh, enzymes that are involved in nitric degradation and all the, also they find some bins weight, they also speculate about that. So this is sort of the differences in the two populations. So again, if we sum up, now we know that at least the human gut overall contains or harbor at least 10 million different genes. We estimate that every individual carries about 600,000 prevalent genes and on average, each of you carry about 200 species. There is a huge, even though you share a lot of these genes and these bacteria, there is a huge variation between one person to the next. There are clearly country-dependent differences. Could be genetics, could be diets, could be environment. And of course, still, I have to tell that since being part of the meter hit, we still believe a little bit in uh, intro types. 
uh, but we can always discuss that. So that was uh, sort of the status of what we know about the human <coughs> uh, metagenome. Then we are doing a lot of mice work. And they come in all shapes, different forms. And uh, it's quite important to know what we're looking at. So there's a lot of factors that might uh, sort of um, influence uh, the metagenome in a mouse. There could be mouse providers. There could be housing conditions. There could be mouse strains. There could be diet. There could be gender. So what we set out was to make sort of a multifactorial approach to this. So we selected mice from six different providers house them under six different conditions, different lab laboratories uh, in the United States, in Europe, in China. We had eight different mouse strains, two diets, and of course, two genders. And then we sort of um, did our normal trick. So we, in total, we analyzed 184 mice, uh, mice. We produced a lot of data, on average five gigabases per each individual, and we created simply a, a, a catalog containing 2.5 seven uh, non-redundant genes using the same MOCAD processing pipeline as we use for this, we use for the human genome. So this is sort of the basic. So now we have this 2.5, uh, seven million genes, and it seems by reaffection to be pretty exhaustive. And also uh, by CARES indices, it is close to 96, 97% complete. What we lack here is really to get some wild mice, because all these are laboratory strains under very defined conditions. So it would be very interesting to go into the, into the wild, get some normal mice, and see how, how diverse they are. But anyway, we have a decent catalog now. So why should we make a mouse catalog? We have an excellent human catalog. So we did a test. So what we did was we took two randomly selected mice, or actually we took more, but this is just two examples here, and then we took all the transcripts that we could analyze from these samples and mapped them back on the human catalog, the 10 million catalog. 25% coverage, less than 20% coverage. Then we mapped them to the mouse catalog, and now we have 100% uh, coverage. So I think it clearly sort of tells that you need a mouse catalog. If you're doing mouse work, you cannot use the very elaborate human catalogs. You need the mouse catalog to get good coverage. Another thing that you should be aware is this is a PCA analysis at the gene level. It's very clear that the provider of these mice actually have a huge influence. So one should be very careful to uh, know that if you're comparing an analysis from all over the world, what was the provider? But also, the laboratory has a, a huge effect. The diet has a huge effect. There's a lot of things you have to, to that are confounding factors. And we were surprised to see that actually analyzing these different strains and different feeds and so on, that provider turned out to be one of the most important, also by Permanova analysis, one of the most important um, uh, factors to sort of account for. Also, just one example, a few examples. If you take black sex mice, put them on a low-fat diet, and we have from either uh, Jackson in the United States or Taconic in the United States. And these were housed at Pfizer in the United States. You can see how, how they sort of separate according to provider or according to housing lab. So it's very clear that the two providers, even if they're kept in the same laboratory, really sort of uh, the mouse are separate. So you have completely different uh, microbiotas. And the same goal if you take uh, black sex mice on a low fat diet from Taconic in Denmark, and now we actually ordered the mice at the same time, we distributed feed at the same time, the same batch of feed to three different laboratories, one in Norway, two in Copenhagen area. And again, the technical university mice are out here, the Norwegian and Copenhagen university are here. So they separate. There's a lot of reason for why this could happen. But in this case, it's something, something to do with the bedding in the, in the animals, uh, in the cages, and so on. But again, it, it's sort of a, a, an indication that one should be extremely careful to extrapolate results from one laboratory to another. And even, again, here, if you analyze at, at the uh, <clears throat> at, at the general level, it's, it's very clear that we get very different results if we compare the two providers. So when you receive mice from these two providers, even if they're labeled black six, they've been on the same diet, they are different when it comes to the microbiota. And if you take, again, the, the black six mice and put them in three different locations, again, they separate. Like, for instance, at the Technical University, the microbiota has a lot of acamantia. And we know that acamantia is quite important when it comes to metabolism. So again, 
it's just sort of a sort of a sign that one should be very, very careful and really standardize. Of course, you would like to ask, I mean, now we're doing a lot of mouse work, what's the relevant in terms of humans? And uh, of course, if you compare sort of the top uh, 20 genera in mice and humans, we see there are certain that goes again, like bacteroides, but there are also something that we find in the mouse, which we don't find in the humans and vice versa. So there, of course, are differences. This is not so surprising. Now, if you just look at the gene level, now we have compared, this is an old catalog, but we didn't actually, <laughs> didn't have time to, to redo all the analysis on the 10 million, but I think this is still quite illustrative. This is an intermediate catalog, four million genes. And you can see here the overlap between the mouse and the human. There are only 96,000 of the mouse genes here in the two catalog that align with the human. Now using Ignaga kicks, you can see it becomes much better. And if, if you look at the kick pathway, the, the functional pathways, I mean, going from here, you see, even though you only have a very slight overlap when it comes to the exact sequence of the genes, the functional overlap is quite dramatic. But again, we can clearly, using a PCA analysis, we can clearly separate sort of the functionality of the human from the, uh, from the, um, from the mouse. And it's also very clear that it's separate things that drives the separation, which is specific for mice, and that is why you can separate them, but still overall the function are very similar. And this is sort of easily depicted here. This is one of these wonderful metabolic pathway diagrams. Red are the shared pathway. And this, of course, reflects that mouse or and human, when they harbor bacteria in the gut, the, the bacteria needs to perform essentially some of the same reactions. So they are similar. But we find some which are human specific and we even know what it is, even though we don't know what it means. And we find some that are mouse specific. Again, we're not quite sure why these transport systems are specific to the mouse and not found in the humans. But we're trying to figure that out now. So the conclusion is that working on mice, we should really take great emphasis in securing that we know what is the origin of these mice. We know that there are significant strain differences. I don't, don't have time to go into that. There's a strong effect on composition. Gender actually also influences quite a lot. And if you look at the gene level, the mouse and humans um, microbiomes are quite different, but functionally, they are very similar. So this is mouse. Uh, we also work on pigs. And as you can see here, there's a good reason for that, because in Denmark, pigs outnumber humans by a factor of five. So there are five times more pigs in Denmark than there are human beings. So of course, pigs are important to Danish industry and to our production. So what we have done here is that we really, again, wanted to make a very uh, comprehensive gene catalog. And uh, so we selected a lot of animals. And we also selected from different countries and different breeds. So we have uh, native pigs from France with Indies, Creola pigs. We have China with Bama, Bahrain, Tibetan pigs. We have selected breed France and Denmark and China, and we have miniature pig models included in that. And in total, we uh, collected fecal samples from a little less than 300 uh, animals and then uh, performed the deep sequencing. And the, the, again, the setup was quite multifactorial because we wanted to answer, to be able to answer uh, uh, different questions. So you can see here, all the pigs were used for construction of the catalog. In the French samples, we could analyze the effect of age. In the Danish samples that were kept in one, this was one commercial cell line that was uh, in <clears throat> three farms, various diets, and in one farm we had different males, females, and castrated males. So in that case, we could look what is the effect of gender, what is the effect of diet. In China, they were all kept in one farm, and they were more or less, this was China, huge mess. So they were just walking around, but there we could actually say, okay, now we can use that for genetics to see what is the influence of genetic background of these different uh, pigs on the metagenome. So this is sort of the raw data. So this is sort of the statistics here, and I think the bottom line is that we were able to make a catalog now of 7.7 .7 million pig genes. And again, this is a pretty complete set of genes we have now. And we were also able to assemble uh, 719 uh, species uh, using bioinformatics, metagenomic species. So this is sort of the, the set. And again, here, if you look at the uh, rarefaction curve, you can see these are the total 
refraction of all the peak samples. And you can see when you get more than about 100, it sort of levels out, meaning again that we have a pretty complete uh, analysis. This is a mouse data. You can see they have much less complexity. And this is a 4 million human refraction curve. So uh, we are still arguing, I mean, we know there are 10 million genes now, but if you just analyze 300 uh, of, of, of 400 uh, human beings, the diversity is actually less than it is if you just analyze um, 300 pigs. But again, the variety, the differences in the pigs we've analyzed are probably far greater than the human samples we analyzed. So I think the most important take home lesson here is that the catalog we have, 7.7 .7 million genes, is pretty uh, good. So what are the differences between the countries? And just looking all over, I mean, it's very clear. We can separate either by gene count or by known species in the selection. It's very clear that the Chinese pig seems to cluster together, even though they are very different breeds, strains. Whereas the Chinese and, uh, sorry, the French and the Danes are more or less uh, combined in one cluster. Looking at, at uh, these different uh, alpha and beta diversity, again, there are differences. It seems as if the, the diversity in the Chinese pig is less. And uh, as I'll come back to discuss a little bit, it may relate to how the Chinese pigs are fed because they are fed a lot of antibiotics. So that may reduce the complexity. The Danish pigs are very healthy and very diverse, even if there's just one strain, one production strain in, in a very uh, defined conditions. The French pig sort of lagging a little bit behind, but they had different pigs. As you can see, there's a lot of different information you can get there, but sort of the, uh, the uh, point is that you see different characters in these pigs. And this is also, if you, for instance, look at the class, this is just one example, class downsizing, you can see how the Chinese pig looks very uniform. I should add, there's a lot we don't know. The green here is unknown, which we cannot annotate, simply because they're not known. But you can see how, how this, the, the, the Chinese pigs actually cluster very well together, whereas the Danish and, and, um, and the French pigs, they have more var variation. So what about genetics? So in this case, we took advantage of the Chinese pigs. And since we have them in the same stable and just running around, we can sort of say, yeah, you can, in fact, cluster these different types of pigs. See that the Tibetan pigs up here, they're very cute. In fact, small black pigs, very tasty, by the way. Uh, they cluster very, very clearly. And then you can see some clustering around the other places as well. So clearly, genetics has, even in the same background, same feed, same environment, uh, they, they are able to, have, to experience differences. In the French pigs, since we had pigs that were um, from very young to very old pigs, we could again see there is sort of a gradient. So clearly we see these very interesting changes when the pig grow old. Again, there's a lot of data we can extract here, but I don't have time to get into what is going on really in detail, but this is what we're looking at now to see what are the characteristics here, because this is a very nice cohort of pigs that were sort of becoming older and older. This, I think, is interesting because this is from the uh, Danish stable. So here we were actually able to see, for instance, what is the difference between males and females and what is the difference between castrated males and males and females. And if we just cluster here, it's very clear that having normal, you can see here, we have pretty good clustering of males and females. So they cluster together. But now if you compare the females with the castrated males, this clustering sort of disappears. So the conclusion is there's no clear separation if you compare castrated males and females. And again, this sort of indicates that what really drives the difference in the gut microbiota, at least in a pig, is testosterone. Whether you have testosterone or not, and maybe some other hormones, but testosterone actually seems to be a key player here to so shaping what we would call a male characteristic microbiota. And then to the antibiotic resistant genes. So again, it's very clear that in China, where you have this widespread use of antibiotics in, 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 in the production, you really cluster the pigs over here, whereas in Denmark and France, where you, don't, you can treat with antibiotics for a very short time during weaning, and if you have disease in the, in the, um, in the herd, but other than that, you don't. So very clearly. So what we can see here also, that it's very clear when you look at the abundance, you can see in China there are lots of, of uh, um, resistance against certain antibiotics that shows up, and also there are some like this fluoroquinol, which is select selectively used in China. 
But you can also see, even though the French and the Danish pigs are not treated with antibiotics regularly, they still contain a lot of antibiotic-resistant genes. So apparently, these genes are simply floating around. And whatever we do, Denmark or France, they will still be there. Uh, if we compare the different sort of diversity, there are specific diversities. I'll not dwell a lot with that, but just carry on here. So one reason for, for looking into uh, pigs were that a lot of people think pigs are much closer to humans than a mouse. And it goes for a lot of physiological phenomena and so on. So very clearly, they, uh, pigs to many extent are closer to man than mice. But again, if you look at the meter genome, you see actually the overlap between mouse and humans, mouse and pigs, and pigs and humans is not very large. Uh, it seems as if there is slightly more genes that overlap between mice and humans. Some uh, 500,000 genes overlaps between uh, um, human and, and pigs, and only 100,000 overlaps between, uh, between um, mouse and, and uh, humans. But still, these differences are not really big. If you look at the core kicks, again, there is, like we saw in the mouse, now we're just talking about core kicks, there is a much more significant overlap, but still there are also clearly differences. So the take-home message is that we have a very nice catalog of, uh, of swine now. We have 7.6 uh, non-redundant gene, and we have these metagenomic species. Comparison with other gut hormone, it seems as if there, there is a larger set of genes that are shared between pigs and humans, but it's not dramatic. We know that detecting uh, antibiotic-resistant genes, the uh, deep sequence is extremely sensitive and really discovered a lot of this but we need to relate what does it mean in terms of are these pigs really antibiotic resistance or not? We don't know. And, in the, and finally, uh, I mean, it's very clear that in pigs, like in mice, we see a lot of the same factors that influence the, the um, composition, strain, breed, diet, gender, age, and country. So that is sort of the pig catalogs. So now we have the three pig catalogs. We're finishing up these papers, and hopefully, uh, some of you that really want this information will soon be, avail it soon be available to you, so we can use it. So now to, to the humans and, and what we know, and I'll just briefly uh, summarize some of, the, some of the projects we have been involved in. And first, I'll talk a little bit about obesity. This is actually where we started, and we did a lot of sequencing. Honestly, we spent millions of dollars on sequencing 2,000 Danes, 1,000 obese, diabetic, 1,000 leans and we found virtually nothing. We found a three new SNPs and, and so on, but honestly, it wasn't worth the money. And again, if you look here at positional GVASC, I mean, we have today about 50 genes that are associated with obesity. They explain about 2 to 3% of all obesity, meaning nothing. And that's why we, of course, looked into, in the meter heat project, looked into obesity, and there we have to understand there are two types of obesity, a healthy one and an unhealthy one. <coughs> And what was discovered, uh, I think initially by Dusko Ehrlich in Paris and then elaborated further in the meter heat consortium, was that we could actually stratify individuals into what we call low gene count individuals and high gene count individuals. And it's very clear you have this biphasic separation. It also seems that the obese have very clearly two peaks, whereas the lean individuals are more skewed towards the high gene count level. Now, what does it mean? If we analyze the um, functional competence of these, it seems as if the high gene count actually have more genes involved in butyrate production, lactate production. And here it shows that in the um, obese individuals, or the low gene count, I should say, individuals, they have a decreased abundance of genes that are involved in these production of these uh, um, substrates or these, um, um, these chemicals that are important for gut health. On, in, on the other side, I mean, the uh, low gene count seems to have much more genes involved in inflammatory processes, in, in mucus degradation, and, and so on. So it seems there was sort of a functional uh, uh, dissociation or a distinction between the high gene count and the low gene count. And what does it mean? So if you look in Denmark, low gene count uh, individuals constitute about 33% of the total population. And if you look at those gene count and compare that compare this uh, part of the population with those that have the high gene count, then we observe that they are overall more fat, 
they have higher adiposity. They have elevated serum leptin, of course, reflecting the um, increased adipose mass. They have decreased serum adip adiponectin, which is bad. They are insulin resistant and hyperinsulinemic. They have dyslipidemia, and they have a more inflamed uh, phenotype. So it seems as if there is a correlation with some of these detrimental metabolic parameters and the low gene count. And then, of course, what can that be used for? And it's actually quite, quite useful because if you look in the population, it's not difficult to tell you are fat, you are not fat, you are lean, you are obese. This is not a problem. The problem is to tell which of you are at risk to develop metabolic disorders. And here we can use this discrimination using a qPCR test to simply measure a few candidate genes that are specific for or are characteristic for low gene count and high gene count. And if you plot that and use these just eight markers here, you actually get a very good rock curve, meaning that you have very high predictive values just analyzing these few genes. So you have an area under the curve which is close to one, which is extremely good. So we think that would make a very interesting way of screening people to see, okay, you are in the risk group, you are not in the risk group. What about diabetes? Again, the story is the same. As I said, we also spend millions of dollars on sequencing Danes, and what did we find? Very little. So today we have about 40 genes associated with type 2 diabetes, and they explain about 10% of all cases of diabetes, which is not very much either. And of course, being focused in the gut, we were looking into the gut microbiota to see can we distinguish. And Again, being in China, it's very easy to get huge cohorts. So we did sort of a, a two-stage analysis. The first stage, we sort of was a, sort of a, a discovery phase where we analyzed, you can see, about equal amount of cases and controls. And based on what we found here, we validated in an independent uh, cohort of, of 100 cases and 100 controls in the second stage here. And what did we find? So using a lot of bioinformatics, we can actually very clearly sort of separate different um, types of bacteria that are associated or enriched in the normal microbiota, in the, non, in the controls, whereas we had other bacteria, metagenomic species, that were associated with the uh, type 2 diabetes. And again here, it seems to be a common denominator. That if you look at what is wrong here, uh, you can see that the green are depleted in type 2 diabetic patients and the red are enriched in type 2. And again, you can see here, you have a lot of these genes that are upregulated in diabetic patients that are involved in oxidative stress and, and things like that. Sh uh, BCA transport, which is also interesting in the terms of, of uh, uh, insulin resistance in humans, whereas you have decreased uh, abundance of genes involved, say, in butyrate production. So again, you have a little bit the same that the type 2 diabetic patient seems to have an impaired um, constitution of the gut microbiota in terms of coping with uh, oxidative stress. They are increased and to produce beneficial uh, compounds like butyrate and, and propionate. And then you can do epidemiologic analysis. This is sort of a very simple summary of, of, of these genes. So what we could see is if you look at the type 2 diabetes, uh, the genetic landscape, uh, what you see is that uh, you have the highest risk gene, TCF7, has an, inc an odds ratio or an increased risk about 1.47, which is actually not very much. We found in the Chinese population that this these two clostridia had an increased risk and odds ratio of 5.89, which is pretty decent, and this one, 23. This is really a lot. And then we have one unknown bacteria, um, this is a metagenomic linkage group, so we think it's a bacteria we haven't been able to isolate. Based on epidemiological studies, and we didn't calculate wrong, it has an increased risk of 266. And now it becomes very interesting, because what is this bug? So we're trying to figure it out, but we don't know yet. This was so uh, extraordinary that we actually didn't dare to put it into the paper when we published, because we said, okay, this is, people will not believe it. Okay, so... Um, Last thing I'll mention is that we are also doing a lot of work on colorectal cancers and some other disorders. And we have just concluded a study where we analyzed a Han Chinese uh, colorectal cancer patient, healthy, and then we sort of uh, also combined it with analysis of Danish patients. So again here, we did the traditional way of having a two-stage approach, a discovery phase, and a validation phase. 
And in this case, we did the validation first in a Chinese population, and then we transferred this information to the Danish population to see could we sort of refine some of the markers in the Danish population. Remember that I told you the Danes and the Chinese have quite different uh, microbiotas, so we need to see are there some signals, some signatures that sort of penetrate the differences in the microbiota. So just looking at the Chinese population, this is a refraction curve. You can see in, in sequence that we came here with a catalog of about 3 million genes. And again, you can see there is a slight difference in the uh, number of genes in the uh, colorectal cancer patients and in the control groups. And this is what you also can see a little bit here on gene count. You can see it seems as if there is a slight decrease in the gene count in the colorectal cancer group, at least in the Han Chinese. And this is slightly reflected in the Shannon uh, alpha diversity, not in the Simpson index. So there are slight differences. In particular, I think the gene count is, is, is valid. Now again, doing the deep sequencing, we were able to do metagenomic analysis to see, can we find uh, sort of what we call co-occurrence network that characterizes the, the uh, patients, uh, the, uh, patients from, um, from, um, from the colorectal cancers. And you can see a lot of those you know, like Fusobacterium nucleatum. This is a known uh, bacteria which is associated with colorectal cancer. But this Pavimonas micron, that's a new one. Solobacterium mori has not really been discovered very much. Preptostactococcus stomatis is also new. So we found this is clearly a, a sort of a group of, of bacteria that seems to correlate with colorectal cancer. Um, and this is just to, to show that using different algorithms, we find pretty robust that Parvimonas actually is increased in colorectal cancer patients. And the same is very true as we would expect for Fusobacterium. This is a bacterium which does not uh, show any difference. As you can see, you don't see any difference between the groups. Uh, so again here, we could repeat sort of this and so that a Solobacterium mori also clearly is increased in colorectal cancer and Peptostreptococcus stomatis have the same. Uh, now we have a number of bacteria that, that actually correlate with, um, with uh, colorectal cancer. Then, of course, we have to move on. And uh, if you take all the genetic, all the genes that we have found in colorectal cancer and in control patients, and we try to do clustering, we see nothing. Then we delimited it to 140 genes, 140,000 genes that looked interesting. And then we came further on. So we came out with 31 markers that seem to be interesting. And using these 31 markers, now we can clearly separate the uh, control group from the colorectal cancer group. And then we have defined what we call a colorectal cancer index. And we analyzed all these different cohorts we had with type 2 diabetes patients, controls, uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients, and, and, and controls. And it's very clear that this index that we have now is very strongly able to separate these different classes of metagenomes from the colorectal cancer genome. Uh, using the 31 markers for a rock analysis, we get a very high predictive value, an area under the curve close to 1. Now we want to do it more simple. So um, going back to the Danish population, using some of these markers, we were actually able to find three markers that are shared by the Chinese and the Danish uh, colorectal cancer community, if I can call it so. And using just these three markers in a qPCR method, we actually get this rock curve. The area here is 0.84, which is decent. It's not perfect, but it's decent, and at least it is a starting point for saying, okay, we might be able, along this way, to get into some very efficient early markers. So this is take-home messages here. Few robust gut microbial markers associated with colorectal cancer in both the Chinese and the Danish population. And that, in our opinion, is that there is a potential for improved early diagnosis based on microbiome analysis rather than blood analysis. But it's also very clear that we need much larger sample to validate our findings. So I think I didn't have to really put a question mark here. So I think that the microbiota is the new target. And it is interesting, because we can modulate it. Then the problem is, what, what is uh, sort of my concluding remarks and, and uh, sort of things? I think this, again, this allergy is where this is what we think we know. We might even be optimistic. This is what we don't know. And I think what we need, we need much more knowledge. 
We need to understand network and co communities. If we don't understand network and communities, we need to know uh, function, uh, functional, uh, how these communities work. We need to know the metabolome of these. We need to know more about host microbial interaction. And finally, but not least, we need causality, causality, causality. And this is where we're going now. We have a lot of association, we have a lot of correlations, but we are really missing causality. What happens if you make transplantation experiments? the right way. Can we put, can we put human, uh, human gut microbial into a mouse and expect that that reflects what is going on? There's so many open questions. It's interesting, but it's a really huge. I would say this is really a challenge. This is not a problem because this is a lot of fun, but I think we should remember causality, causality, and causality. This is what we are missing. A lot of people have been involved in the work. So some of them are here. There's a lot of a wonderful Chinese group some of them are listed here. Uh, Xiao Liang, of course, Wang Jun, Jun Di started the whole thing. I have a wonderful group uh, working on that in Copenhagen. We are working together with Wolf Peters and Torben Hansen and Manny Arumogan at the um, Metabolism Center. A wonderful collaboration with these very good bioinformaticians at, at DTU. Pfizer was involved in the mouse work. We have been doing a lot of mouse work together at Tickle University. Um, Frederick is involved also in lot. I didn't talk about the infant because I thought that he would talk about that later at this meeting, so I skipped that. Of course, we have been working with Michel Clearbesen, who is sitting there, and we have to catch up. And then we are working a lot with uh, the National Institute in, uh, in Paris, Dusquelis, Joel Duray, Jordi, and Uliaxis. Uh, so, thank you for listening. <laughs>